Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command. So far our gospel text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When we look at this text, um, right before it was the first part of Jesus' discourse on uh, abiding in him. I mean, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And that's a, a teaching that I remember even from grade school. Okay, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we're supposed to abide in him. I confess, I didn't really quite understand what that meant, but I, I, I understood that Jesus is the vine and that we are the branches. And so that all life that we have comes from him. But then Jesus goes on and he seems to set up some rules of friendship. And I, I was amused by uh, our, our kids' various answers this morning. During the eight o'clock service, some of the kids said, well, if they do the same things we do, we can be friends, okay. And if, we, if we're nice, if they do things for me, that type of thing, these are all rules of friendship, so to speak. I mean, it's easy for Pastor Nathan, right? If you brew me some coffee, we can be friends, right? That'll be great. If, but there are, I suppose, other rules too, right? If you're always there for me, if you have my back, if you like the same things I do, we can, we can be friends. We can be friendly with each other. But Jesus' words are very particular. You are my friends if you do what I command. This isn't a please always be nice to me and always hang out with me and watch my back and, and never ever disagree with me. Although let's face it, we as Christians would do well to do those things. Those are Christian things to do with our Lord. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Which begs the question, what does Jesus command us to do? And if you take a look at the gospel text, he goes into detail. He says, remain in my love, the same love I have received from my father. And love each other as I have loved you. Oh, he also mentions that, you know, I'm going to give my life for you. So love each other that way. And go bear fruit that my joy may remain in you. And this is my command for you. Love each other. These are his commands. And if we were to love each other as he has loved us, we also note that Jesus is also getting his love from someone else. Jesus is loved by the Father. This is the first verse in our text. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Go and remain in my love. In other words, Jesus is saying he has love from the Father, and this love from the Father he is now sharing with each of us, and so in the same way, this love that he is sharing with us is the same he has with the Father, and you should love each other in that same way. This love that Jesus shares with his Father is very close. They abide together in a perfect and close communion. And this communion is, is a mystery. We don't understand exactly how it works, but we're going to get a glimpse of it. We're going to experience it shortly here at the altar as we take his communion with us. Now, Jesus says, you are my friends. You are no longer my servants. He contrasts the term friend with the term servant. And I've always been interested by this Greek word servant. It's not like a maid. It's not like a employee of a corporation, all right? This term was specifically bond servant. The King James Version, I believe, says slave. And that's an appropriate interpretation. For the understanding of a slave at the time was the master has absolute power and you do what he says. You do it or you suffer his wrath. You do it if you expect to earn a decent living, you are completely dependent on your master's good pleasure and obedience to him. But if we understand this contrasted to 
friend, there's a little difference. Let me give you an example. In high school, I worked at McDonald's. And I didn't really share, so to speak, in the mission of McDonald's to make money, right? Well, maybe, maybe I did, because I was there to make money, right? But I wasn't trying to make everyone smile. I just did it because I was going to get paid to, right? And I was polite to people because I was required to be polite to people, even though they weren't polite to me all the time. You know, there, there was this understanding of, I'm just here to do my job. Can we... Can you order your food and can we get on with the day? Sometimes that's the servant mentality I had at McDonald's, all right? But if I was, if I was a friend of good old Ronald McDonald, if I was a friend of the one I served, there would be a different sense of serving, wouldn't there? I wouldn't do it just because I had to get paid or I'd get fired, right? I did it because I love that one. There's no, the, the sense of strict obedience isn't because otherwise I'll get punished. It's done because there's communion and there's love involved with this friend of yours. This is our, this is how uh, being Christ's friend, it's not about what you do to earn money. It's about who you are are because you are loved. And this is how you respond to his love. And let's face it, if we are going to obey his commands, this is harder than the simple phrase, obey his commands. Okay, anyone can say, I follow Christ. Anyone can say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And yet, that's hard that's impossible to do. And if I, it's, it's really easy to say, I love my neighbor as myself, but I don't often do that. <laughs> we, do, we don't often do that, do we? I mean, doing what our Lord commands means being faithful even to the point of death. And all the shame and bitterness and scorn levied against Christians, we are still to remain faithful to him. This also means that if we are going to obey him, we should read about him daily and follow his spirit hourly. This is not something our nature readily does. This is not something we are familiar with with. And yet Jesus says, do what I command. You are my friend if you do what I command. Now, I like the word he uses for the word friend. All right. Um, we already have a good understanding of what the servant does. What does the friend do? Who is this friend? How is it defined? Um, the Greek word that Jesus uses is phileo. It's a great word. And it comes uh, from this understanding of brotherly love, right? If you've heard of the city of Philadelphia, that's the city of brotherly love. Uh, other definitions we might use is uh, beloved one, dear one, affectionate friend. In other words, a friend who would do absolutely anything for you, feels very strongly about you, loves you to death, will be your best friend forever, period. No doubt about it. If you've ever read any of the awesome stories about King David and his best friend, Jonathan, the son of his worst enemy, <laughs> then you get to get an idea of what this friendship should have looked like. It's written in 1 Samuel, so check it out. It's, it's, it's a great story about the brotherly bond of friendship these men had. And, and this wasn't romantic. This wasn't anything twisted. It was simply brotherly love. Phileo is often uh, defined as one of the words of love in the Bible, but there are other words too. There's agape, right? The all-encompassing love that God has for his son and for his rebellious children. 
All right, that's, that's agape. That's the all-powerful and amazing love that God has for you. And then there's phileo, the brotherly love. Then there's another love that is between husband and wife. All right? And only husband and wife. This is a good love. Now, the word phileo is often used, this, this, this term, beloved one, friend, is used to describe a second in a duel. If you were to duel someone, you would name your second, your, the guy you trust with your life, literally, <laughs> all right? If you were to name a, a phileo, you would name your right-hand man who would stand beside you in battle and guard you on your unprotected side. This word phileo describes your best man or your maid of honor at a wedding, the one you can count on no matter what. This is the sense of the word friend. Jesus wraps it up. He says, to keep my commands, this is my command to you to love one another. But let's face it, we can't really do that unless several things are done for us first. One, we need to be shown how to love one another. We need to be instructed as to how that love works. And Jesus does that readily for us. He shows us how. He even tells us greater love has none other than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. Now, Jesus did this, for he humbled himself even to death, a death on a cross. This is his love for us. And more than that, we need to be given a will to love one another as ourselves. We need to be actually given a desire to do so. And each of you have received this in your baptism where water and word combine to wash away your old sinful nature and to give you a new nature, the nature of Christ, which by its own nature loves. All right? And even more, as you grow in your baptismal nature, you are to also receive bread and wine, which is his body and his blood. And in doing so, you are to receive Christ into yourself, so that your sins may be forgiven, your soul and faith strengthened, so that you may continue to love one another as Christ loved you. So do it. Love one another. Consider how Christ has shown his love for you. He has cared for you. He has saved you from your sin and death forever. And most importantly, he didn't place himself as more worthy over you. He, he placed his own wants and desires beneath your need for saving. He humbled himself in this way for you. So care about each other's needs and desires. Provide a listening ear or even a shoulder to cry on as necessary. Be Christ to one another. Dear Christians, <laughs> portray and show Christ to one another. In doing this, you will fulfill his command to love one another. And in that, you are his friends. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.